I'm pleased to introduce Jessica Fonzo. Uh, she is the Bloomberg Distinguished Professor of Global Food Policy and Ethics at the Berman Institute of Bioethics in the Bloomberg School of Public Health and SAIS at Johns Hopkins University. She was the, also the first laureate of the Carrasso Foundation Sustainable Diets Prize in 2012 for her research on sustainable food and diets for long-term human health. And I hope Louise is able to at least uh, listen in because she was so excited uh, uh, for Jessica's presentation today. So thank you all for being here and thank you, Jessica. Great, well, thank you so much for having me in the Global Development Seminar. It's really nice to at least see everybody. I'm sorry I can't be there in person. I'm actually in Bologna, Italy, um, where the Johns Hopkins has a campus, the Public Policy School of DC has also has a campus in Bologna and Nanjing. And so I'm in Bologna for the semester, but trying to head home maybe this Saturday, let's, let's hope I can get back home with the new variant that is spreading around the world, unfortunately. But anyway, sorry I cannot be with you live. Um, I'm gonna share my screen. Just let me know if you can see that. So today I'm going to focus on, can we have it all? You know, can we have both human and planetary health? Hopefully the answer is yes, <laughs> but it'll be a long, hard slog to get there. And so we'll, we'll talk a bit about the challenges that we face. So I'll first start off with food systems. Food systems are both instigators and victims of climate change, but food is also the link between climate and health. It's the, it's the tether that brings those two worlds together and why that's so important. We'll talk about the impacts of climate change on diets, food security, nutrition, the ethical challenges that we face if we want to transform our food systems in positive directions, and then I'll try to get to the, can we have it all? And we'll try to end on a positive note of some potential solutions that the world should focus on. So food systems, victims and instigators of climate change. This is a graph showing you um, that we are really going in the wrong direction. If you look at the top three graphs, it's showing you the I'm getting my laser pointer. It's showing you the greenhouse gas emissions have been rising. Carbon dioxide, nitrous oxide, and methane have been rising. But there's also other impacts on different earth systems, be it, of course, temperature uh, rising, ocean acidification increasing, significant deforestation loss, massive land use change, and biosphere degradation. And a lot of that has to do with us. We as humans are having a significant impact on all earth systems. We are living in the middle of the Anthropocene. So the way we live our lives, um, sorry, I'm struggling a bit here to get my, the way we are living our lives, be it our population pressure and growth, our use of energy, our use of water, urbanization, building of dams, transportation, telecoms, you name it, humans are having the biggest impact on, on climate. And that is acknowledged in almost every country in the world with maybe the exception of some, some individuals in the United States, but overall humans are the biggest instigator of climate breakdown. And when we look at the impacts of climate change on food, we can see that this is projecting a three degree warmer and very scarier world in which we will see significant impacts on crop yields of different crops. Um, this in, is showing you in red, the declines in crop yields in green up in the Northern territories of the world would have bumper crops, but overall, the projections of climate change on the ability to grow enough food to feed the world do not look good. We also know that 
under certain conditions, what's called a CO2 fertilization effect, where you have more CO2 in the atmosphere, there will be uh, changes in the nutritional composition of some crops, maize, rice, wheat, soy, you name the big crops that the world consumes, we'll see declines in the nutritional quality of some of those crops in a CO2 fertilization type situation with 20% declines in protein, declines of 15% in iron and zinc, two nutrients, two micronutrients being already significant issues for a significant number of people in the world. Well, so this is quite alarming to see, and we can talk about multiple breadbasket failures and food system shocks that we're already starting to see tricklings of these, these shock type situations. But what we realize is that food systems are complex. Sometimes they can be resilient. Sometimes they can be very fragile. And the reason is that when you look at this diagram, these, this is a depiction of food systems. <clears throat> food systems have so many components, so many actors, and so many scales. You know, we've got global systems to very local systems. We've got transnational companies to very small, medium enterprise private sector holders. So we have so many different types of scales, so many different components of food systems that can move food systems in positive and negative directions. Here in the center are the components of food systems. We've got food supply chains. Food is produced, it's stored, it's processed, it's packaged, and it moves to markets. You, as the individual, consumer or eater, you walk into a food environment where you decide what you are going to purchase or what you're going to order. You bring with yourself your own aspirations, your knowledge, your purchasing power, your own situations and influences. And that is shaping the decisions that you make about your diets. Food environments as well are shaping those decisions. How far is the market? What kind of food is at the market? What's the price of those foods? What's the marketing and advertising? Do they have organic food? All of these different uh, choice architecture attributes are influencing your decisions about what you buy and influencing your diets. And if you look at the very end here, these are the outcomes that we want the food systems. We want them to be environmentally sustainable. We want them to contribute to nutrition and health. We want them to promote equitable livelihoods and economic growth. And we want them to be equitable and be inclusive. We're asking a lot of our food systems. And clearly food systems and the way they're being governed and the way they're being directed by different actors are not fulfilling these different outcomes. Much of that has to do with the drivers on the left, urbanization, politics, trade, globalization, sociocultural dynamics, you name it, everything is touching food systems in some different way and influencing their ability to deliver on these outcomes. Now, food systems are also contributing to greenhouse gas emissions. This is a graph showing you the contributions of greenhouse gases um, uh, from the food system, be it agriculture production, emissions coming from fertilizers, emissions coming from cattle, from rice, from manure and pasture management, land use changes. And then of course, the supply chain is also contributing to greenhouse gases. And what we know is that food systems generate somewhere between, depending on the estimate, 20 to 37% of total greenhouse gas emissions, roughly 30%. Agriculture though is also contributing to natural resource degradation. It uses a lot of freshwater resources. It's contributing to biodiversity loss, deforestation, putting extinction uh, at a higher rate for some animal and plant species including fish stocks, for example. And the way we grow our food is also contributing to different environmental stresses. 
This is some work that we did and Mario Herrero's on the call uh, with Marco Springman and colleagues a couple of years ago that contributed to the Eat Lancet Commission showing you the environmental stresses, looking at five metrics, greenhouse gas emissions, land use change, water use, nitrogen and phosphorus application, nutrient runoff into waterways, for example, and looked at the agriculture systems contribution in growing different food groups. And, if, and this is showing you in the first bar graph is present day, and business as usual out to 2050. And you can see that animal products significantly contribute to greenhouse gas emissions, of course, depending on how they're raised. But other foods, depending on where and how they're grown, are also contributing to different environmental stresses, be it fruits and vegetables, certain fruits and vegetables, certain nuts with water footprint, think cashews, avocados, staple grains, putting environmental stress on landscapes. So it's not just that cows are the, the bad guy, although they do contribute a lot to greenhouse gas emissions through their methane uh, production. It's also other foods and how and where they're grown and their, uh, their taxing on the environment. Well, what about the impacts of climate on diets and food security? When we look at climate change, it's definitely a threat to food security when we look out in future years. This is showing you three of the different SSPs. SSP1 is you know, the green road approach. Uh, two is the middle of the road and red is the rocky road. The business as usual, no action on climate change. And you can see looking out to 2040, the population at risk for hunger will increase in the business as usual approach. And dietary energy availability will decline. So climate change is clearly uh, a potential risk for <clears throat> food insecurity moving forward when we think about a business as usual. But if we actually took action on climate, you can see these other scenarios are, are seeing significant declines in, in people that go to bed hungry and the availability of food. And attached to that are the burdens of malnutrition. We have roughly 10% of the world's population who go to bed hungry. That number has been rising for the last five years due to climate change, the three Cs, climate change, COVID and conflict. We have 150 million children under the age of five who are chronically undernourished or stunted. That may not seem like a lot, but that's about 22% of the world's children under the age of five. That's a huge burden. And it's very difficult for countries to come out of that kind of a burden. We have 45 million children who are acutely malnourished or wasted very high risk of mortality for children that are wasted. And that number has largely not changed the entire time I've been a nutritionist, which is too many years to acknowledge. <laughs> and we have 2.2 billion adults. This is new number coming out from the Global Nutrition Report that was released last week who are overweight and obese and putting us at risk for non-communicable diseases. Most of these burdens, these double, triple burdens if you counted micronutrient deficiencies are now in low and middle income countries. And this is incredibly complex for governments to get out of, to tackle, because each of these burdens of malnutrition have a different set of interventions. We could talk about healthy diets being a core mm. intervention across I all of it. them, um, but overall really difficult to come out of. Why am I struggling with this so much? Okay. Um, and of course, diets are contributing to that malnutrition burden. When we look at uh, the global burden of disease, dietary risks are one of the top risk factors of morbidity and mortality now, which is incredible. More than air pollution, which we're hearing a lot about related to climate change, tobacco, alcoholism, it's these diets and it's these suboptimal diets that are high in ultra processed foods like 
foods high in sugar, salts, and fats, and low in the healthy, pr health promoting foods, whole grains, fruits, nuts, and seeds, and vegetables. And most people are now dying from non communicable diseases, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, cancer. And these are all diet related risk factors. Inequities are also deepening and plaguing progress. When we look at the percentage of the population who cannot afford a healthy diet, a healthy diet meaning it meets nutritional needs and it promotes health, protective against diet-related non-communicable diseases. You can see in the dark brown, these are the countries that struggle 75 to 100% of the population cannot afford a healthy diet. That's incredible. So you see in the tropics, Sub-Saharan Africa, South Asia, and to East Asia, most people can't afford that healthy diet. And FAO published these figures this year, and this will they'll go forward publishing these every year in the state of food security nutrition report. Three billion people cannot afford a healthy diet, basically half of the world, which begs the question of why, why do we have so many inequities? And a lot of that has to do with things outside the food system, systemic injustices based on the color of your skin, based on your tribe, your religion, where you live, who you are. And we see that all around the world. I've put in two pictures of the places where I work and Baltimore is on the, on the left where Johns Hopkins is, Timor-Leste, a place where I work a lot. Um, on the other side of the world, all of these places where you see high burdens of malnutrition, of course, poverty is a significant uh, risk for malnutrition, but there's so many other determinants outside uh, the food system beyond just unhealthy diets that lead to these poor outcomes and these significant disparities. Um, some of them are the same, and some of them are quite different. But overall, we're seeing significant uh, issues of injustices around the world. And the food system just shows those injustices in, in profound ways. Zoonotic diseases are also rising. We, <laughs> we're living in the middle of a pandemic. I don't think I need to say that, which is likely a zoonotic disease due to a spillover event that jumped from animals to humans. 60% of emerging infectious diseases are zoonotic. And of that, about 70% originate in wildlife. Well, why am I talking about this? Well, food and agriculture play a big part in the rise of zoonotic spillover events. Because we need to grow food for a significant population, we are shrinking natural habitats, or destroying natural habitats where these wildlife live. And we're putting them in closer proximity to domesticated animals and humans, which puts us at higher risk. And this is a heat map showing you the zoonotic infectious diseases uh, with yellow lit up of these spatial patterns, which is very scary for South Asia to be seeing a map like this as we move into the future. And to, to kind of perpetuate these inequities, we we know that food prices are increasing right now. We thought that the food system was safe during the COVID pandemic last year, but now the long haul is showing its ugly head and that we're starting to see some of the breakdowns of a year in a pandemic or more with supply chain breakdowns, food price increases. And this is showing you um, SSP, this is the rocky road scenario versus the green road scenario showing you that food prices will increase with climate change uh, if we don't take action. And that could be devastating. We know that in the last two food price spikes of 2008 and 2011, we saw significant uprising of protests and riots in the streets that's shown in the green bars the blue is showing you the FAO food price index. Where there's hunger, where there's rising prices and people can't get enough food on the table to feed their families, that creates social unrest. And that's a very scary 
situation for these families to be in, but for countries to be in as well. And of course, when we start to see food price spikes, we start to see crop failures, multiple breadbasket failures, people are gonna move, they're gonna migrate, and we're gonna see this more and more. Um, this was a, a great article in the New York Times, if any of you read it on the great climate migration that we're already starting to see from Latin America into North America. So what are some of the ethical challenges to transform our food systems in positive directions? Well, what, I, what do I mean by food transformation? When you think about the Food Systems Summit, they wanted four things. To ensure available, accessible, affordable food, and that being sufficient, nutritious, safe, and desirable food for everyone. <laughs> it's a big ask, but not, <laughs> not, uh, not so uh, crazy. To be produced from sustainable and resilient food systems, to promote fair and equitable livelihoods of food system workers who are feeding us every day and to benefit nature. It's a lot to ask. And when you ask people, well, what do they think of when they think of food system transformation? Well, people have different meanings. Some people will say community. Some people will say reciprocity. Some people will say dignity. You know, so the way our food systems need to transform is different depending on what you want from your food system. And everyone has different values and different interpretations. But one of, the, one of the big issues we have ethically is who suffers the consequences of the world's dietary choices? We know that in many high-income countries and, and those who tend to be wealthier, energy-intensive lifestyles and dietary choices are significant anthropogenic contributors to climate change. And the economically poor households will disproportionately suffer the impacts of that climate change. So is that fair? And we saw a lot of that conversation at the COP meeting. Is it fair for low-income countries to suffer and pay equally as high-income countries who've generated so much more greenhouse gas emissions? When we look just at consumption of animal source foods, this is showing you on the top the United States, here's the UK and Brazil. Look at this compared to Cambodia, Senegal, Ethiopia. In countries like the United States, we're consuming, consuming 10 times more animal source foods, way more than we need for our nutritional requirements than places who don't get enough. So this is a big conundrum that the Food System Summit really did not resolve. And the issue is, is that as countries get wealthier, as people get wealthier, they demand more meat. We've seen it over and over again. So what do we do? Is this okay? How do we deal with these inequities? Another issue is what kind of food should be grown that's permissible when people are still going to bed hungry? Should we be growing a lot of livestock? It's a big question. Um, is it the best use of finite natural resources? Is it the best use of water? Is it the best use of grains? Is it the best use of land? When we look at the land that's grown for agriculture, 77% of that is being taken up by livestock for meat and dairy, but that only meets 18% of the calories that the world consumes. So again, is that the best use of finite resources and the best distribution of calories. The Eat Lancet Commission, something that I was on and Mario was on, um, we looked at whether or not, what the, what the agriculture system would look like if the world were to eat the Eat Lancet diet, a very plant dominant diet. And so what this graph is showing you, the yellows is just business as usual diet, business as usual agriculture, wasting all the food that we do now, which is roughly 30%. The green bar is showing you if the world, the whole world were to eat the Eat Lancet diet. So very plant dominant, very low animal source foods, and we cut food waste in half. And 
look at the significant changes we'd have to make in the agriculture system. No increase in cereal production. <laughs> it's a little different than the way R&D is structured right now for, for agriculture. Um, 75, 50% increase in fruits and veg. And uh, a colleague of Mario, uh, Daniel Masson de Croze, did a great analysis showing you that vegetable and fruit supply, if everyone were to consume the WHO recommended fruits and veg per day, there's not enough supply to go around of fruits and vegetables. So we would need to significantly change production systems. Fish, 50% increase, we'd have to come from aquaculture, legumes, nuts, almost doubling. And red meat production would come down 65%. <laughs> and this was the incredibly contentious part of the Eat Lancet Commission and why many of us received a lot of hate mail and death threats when this came out. This was uh, incredibly contentious for the livestock community to see 65% reduction in red meat. And what about some of those marginalized communities that are still producing animal source foods? Um, my colleague, Elizabeth Fox, who's at Cornell now, you guys luckily scored her. Um, she was doing some work with me looking at pastoral communities and, and how they're marginalized and how, um, what are some of the ethical constraints that they deal with amongst all the other constraints. And she has a paper coming out looking at um, through using photo voice, which is a very powerful ethnographic way of, of giving voice to those who, who usually have no voice um, to be able to describe their constraints that they have and, and look forward to seeing that paper when that comes out in the next year. Another ethical issue is who shapes and governs food systems. This is showing you We've got 1.5 billion producers and 7.5, well, now almost 8 billion eaters, consumers. When we look across the middle of the value chain and the very front part of the value chain, the ag input side, we have incredible consolidation and concentration of these, of these parts of the chain, which is worrisome. Because at the end of the day, are governments in control of their food system? Are they governing and shepherding their food systems in the directions for public health, for environmental sustainability, and to ensure that their citizens are fed? That's the question is the food system has significant power imbalances that we need to come to, to reckon with. And the last ethical issue is who will feed the world? We are becoming a very urban society. Rural populations will peak in 2022. And I love this, this from Ruth DeFries at Columbia University. She wrote a book called The Big Ratchet. Now we are transforming from farmers to urbanites. Our newest experiment to feed massive numbers of people from the work of a few is just beginning. The outcome is yet to be seen. If the world's farmer average age is 60, who is going to feed us in 30 years? Unsolved. So can we have it all? Can we have both human and planetary health? I've shown you some of the challenges, shown you some of the ethical intractable dilemmas that we face that many of us thought that the UN food system would solve, but it really didn't. So where do we go now? Well, I like this quote from Joan Didion. She wrote a, a, a story called Goodbye to All That. She was leaving New York to go to LA. And the very beginning of the story, she says, it's easy to see the beginnings of things and harder to see the ends. We don't know where we're gonna end up here. And we hope that it ends well, but it's gonna take a lot of effort to transform our food systems particularly from governments and from the private sector and from even consumers rising up and advocating for a better food system. So the first thing we have to do is take a business unusual approach if we want to stay within the Paris climate change targets. What this is showing is that 
if we took action on food systems, well, if we took no action on food systems, this is the gray bar, but we addressed fossil fuels and energy and transportation, which is incredible that the COP26, the first time fossil fuels has been in the text, in the negotiating text, has finally happened 26 COPs later. If we address that, but we didn't do anything in food, we still wouldn't meet the Paris Climate Agreement. So we have to take action on food. The question is what? So when you look at these different what's, increasing yields, cutting food waste in half, eating within your calories, not over consuming, more sustainable farm practices or a plant rich diet, you start to get towards the 1.5 degree Paris holding target. Now, if we did all of those at 50%, we would stay at that 1.5. If we do them all fully, we'd actually be on a great course. So we have to take action on food systems if we want to address climate. And we have to do a bit of everything across food systems. It's not just diets. It's not just farmers doing more sustainable practices. It's everything. And that's what makes it more challenging. We have to harness the political momentum that we have now and not make these moments meaningless. What a year. We had the Food System Summit. We had a cop that probably got more press coverage than ever before. We're sitting in the middle of two decades important for nutrition and family farming. We're on the International Year of Fruits and Veg. We got 10 years left of the SDGs. Let's not squander this time. Let's take the moments that we had and really push. Let's not make it like the MDGs where a lot of countries didn't achieve them and we just moved on to the next set of global goals. This is the time we really need to take action. We need to provide the evidence and data to help policymakers make informed decisions. Two initiatives that we've started is the Food Systems Dashboard and the Food Systems Countdown Initiative in which the dashboard is trying to bring lots of food systems data together in an easily understandable, visually appealing way to help policymakers understand the state of their food systems. The Food Systems Countdown Initiative is a group of us working to identify the highest quality indicators that would assess performance of food systems over the next decade. Both again being to help decision makers make evidence-based decisions. The fourth thing is for all of you, don't give up on research and evidence. This is a tough time for us scientists, isn't it? Science is being openly disregarded suspect, treated as suspect by policymakers, business leaders, but research can play a really important role and generate and put us on a positive and sustainable direction for global food security, nutrition, and health. It can bring wholesale changes in attitudes, political thought and action. And some of us have been lucky to have had their research taken up by policymakers. We've got the great Pear Pinstrip Anderson on this call who has been incredibly influential in global food policy. So don't give up on that. Don't give up on the research and evidence. Keep fighting the good fight and getting your research out there into the right hands um, to influence policy. It's so important, as frustrating as it can be. We need to use all the tools in the toolbox. This is a paper by Cynthia Rosenswig. I think Mario is on this paper as well. Came out from the IPCC on land use. And I really like this paper because it talks about all of these different actions you can take across improving crop management, improving livestock management, improving supply chains, improving diets and consumer demand, and ranks them as being um, high to low potential for mitigating and adapting to climate change. There's so many tools 
we just need to invest in those and scale them up and governments need to take notice. We also need to focus on the entire system. We also always focus on diets and production. There's this whole middle part of the chain that needs more attention, the missing middle. And we've done some work looking at, well, what's the evidence to make the supply chain more nutrition sensitive and climate sensitive, these win-wins. We need to be thinking about the entire supply chain, not just production and not just what we're eating. There's a whole world that sits in the middle of that with many actors dipping in and out where we can make significant changes for nutrition and climate. And this is work by Chris Barrett that we worked on with him uh, looking at some of these innovations that can happen across agri-food systems. And I just wanted to point out this middle part. All technologies, innovations, interventions, solutions, whatever you wanna call them, none of this is possible without people. Putting people at the center of food systems, creating the enabling environment to push these issues from a political and social perspective. So this socio-technical interface is so critical. We also need to consider how food environments are transforming. This is my colleague, Shauna Downs. We published this paper looking at food environments, the places where you shop, they're significantly changing. We have formal markets, but we also have very informal markets around the world that are feeding people. We need to take notice of these food environments. One of the works that we're doing is in the Mekong River, trying to understand the political implications of the management of the Mekong River upstream and how it will impact the 60 million people living downstream of the Mekong due to dams for hydropower and how that's influencing the river as a food environment, this moving food environment, this very dynamic food environment. And so we're doing some work in the Mekong River. If anyone's interested in learning more, collaborating, we're always keen to, to, to do so. I just have a few more slides. We need to get over our staple fetish. We've been talking about this for decades in the nutrition community, trying to get agriculture to focus on other things besides maize, rice, rice and, and, and wheat. Um, and unfortunately, our biodiversity is dwindling. Most of our uh, calories come from 12 crops. 75% of our calories come from just 12 crops and five animal species. And we've lost a lot of those indigenous, neglected, underutilized species. And we've moved more towards the big crops, maize, rice, and wheat, soybean, palm oil, so we're losing some of that diversity. And what we produce is really not aligned to what we want to eat. We are subsidizing cereals, staples, oils, and sugar, which is not really the ideal healthy diet. We wanna be eating fruits and veg, meat and meat alternatives and other protein sources. And of course, some cereals and, and, and starches, but we really need to realign the agriculture system through better, better subsidy policies and other policies that promote rural smallholders to continue to be biodiverse, to continue to be invested in from an infrastructure point of view so they can get some of these perishable foods to markets. Something that I was involved in, the blue food assessment is another avenue. Let's think about fish. You know, why is fish never on the agenda? I am a particular fan of bivalves. Clams are my favorite food. And when you look at clams and, and oysters and mussels, um, you can look at the greenhouse gas emissions are quite low. You see up here at the top, nitrogen emissions, low. Um, land use, really no land use change. Um, high in B12, you can see here, high in iron, these are like, the superfood, right? I never like to talk about superfoods, but bivalves, another fish species are incredibly important and need to be more on the agenda. But even when you look at bivalves, this is shown in purple circles in different countries, they're not very highly consumed. 
they're an underutilized source. So we also need to be thinking about blue foods and blue food systems as alternatives to a potentially new way of thinking about how we're gonna feed the world. Well, what about consumers? Well, when we think about what consumers are eating, ultra processed foods, they're tasty, they're cheap and they're convenient. And the growth of those foods and drinks is incredible around the world. So what do we do? How do we move towards more healthy and sustainable foods when these foods are incredibly inexpensive and they're really, really tasty? <laughs> I, I eat them myself. We can never, you know, we're not all uh, saints here. But we don't know the environmental impacts of those foods, never really been assessed. And what will consumers shift to? Will everyone be eating lab-grown meats? Will everyone be eating insects? What is ethically permissible, acceptable, and affordable for consumers moving forward? And what role can private sector play and ensuring that healthy foods are tasty, affordable, and convenient. Again, this is work by Elizabeth Fox. She did her postdoc with me. This is a US uh, population in which we asked them to sort 41 foods, these 41 foods. And naturally people sorted them by food group. But interestingly, they struggled to sort plant-based milk, impossible burger, lab-grown meat, <laughs> and instant ramen noodles. What are instant ramen noodles? Are they actually a food? But clearly US consumers really struggled to sort these into the traditional food groups, which is, is quite fascinating and telling of potential acceptability in some communities. And just my second to last slide, we have so much to learn from COVID, you know, food systems, we're rel relatively stable. We're seeing some breakdown of that now, but we know that supporting and protecting food system workers, particularly those who are delivering and cooking and selling our food to us weren't valued or protected. And we know that they need support and protection and need, need to be valued. We know social protection programs are so important with the economic downturn. And we need much more governance around the illegal sales of wildlife, a systematic global effort to monitor pathogens and a One Health approach for, for the research that we do. And we know that COVID was a shock to the health system and it had implications for every other system, including food, education, economic systems. So food systems engage in this very complex dance with other systems. And we can't think of them separately. We have to think of them as, as together issues. And last, we really need to fix some of the big elephants in the room. I know we as researchers don't like to engage in political processes, but if we really wanna see improvements in our food system, we need a political environment. We need a big movement and more networks to push the agenda, advocate for change to governments. We need more investment in food systems. We have very little investment in, for example, nutrition. And we need to balance the power issues, the conflicts of interest. This is fracturing the communities of the food system, which we saw play out in the UN Food System Summit. So these are some of the issues that we need to contend with and there's no easy answers, but ignoring them won't allow for you to get your work out there. We need to engage in the political process and, and put evidence in the hands of governments, advocate for change and ensure that private sector is doing the right thing and, and be the watchdogs. And I'll end there. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Jessica, for such a thoughtful and, and clear and comprehensive talk. Uh, let's have a few questions. I'm trying to get my, oh, can't Do you see, see us? Yes, <laughs> sorry. 
going to repeat what Tucker said, um, Terry said, and thank you for that. Um, my name is Gloria. I'm currently a fourth year MS PhD student here in the Department of Natural Resources. And so we're working on a faculty-led research project based on my research in Haiti. Uh, Luis Buck is actually on my committee. Hi, Luis. <laughs> um, and so my question is, in countries such as Haiti, where I'm doing my work, where our evidence might just be limited to just like local actual applications or applications that will never probably reach a, a policy that will be adapted because the state is so fragile. What's your advice for researchers do, conducting research in, in areas like Haiti um, in terms of trying to get the evidence to be translated into something or perhaps even getting our evidence into the hands of the agencies or organizations that actually have the capacity to pilot um, interventions or actually try to integrate our findings into their work because um, these organizations will always be um, on ground where I'm working, but our research is very local um, in a way and also do not randomize control studies. So it's hard to like, how do we get this, these amazing findings to those that can actually implement things based on those findings? Thank you. Yeah, that to me, that's where it all starts at the local level. I was just on a panel today for the Nutrition for Growth Summit, yet another summit, <laughs> and uh, it was all about urban food systems. And some of the best uh, parts of the panel were those that were doing this local level work with communities in some of the hardest places in the world. To me, that's, that's where it starts. That's where really the rubber meets the road. We can talk at the global level about these political processes, but at the end of the day, do they touch the farmer in Haiti and what she's doing every day? Right. So to me, the local piece is the core piece and we build up from there. So to me, keep doing what you're doing. There's lots of different ways to collect evidence. It's not just randomized control trials. There's wonderful ways to collect evidence around indigenous people's knowledge, so many different types of evidence. But to me, the local piece is, is the key piece where not only um, are you making the biggest impact on people's lives, but um, those are the gems that everyone's looking for is how did you actually do it on the ground? How did you make it happen instead of just kind of the political wonk talk at the global level? So to me, keep doing what you're doing, especially doing it in these hardship places. Um, because that's where you're going to see the biggest impact. Hi, um, I'm a first year student. I just have one uh, simple question. And what would your advice be for Gen Z? Geez, get out on the streets, get out there and fight for a better food system. I mean, to me, you guys have this window Right. I mean, and Mario probably can back me up on this if, I, if he thinks I'm wrong, but climate change is your challenge of your lifetime. You know, when we were growing up, it was kind of poverty reduction, I would say. You know, how do we end poverty? That was our call. And we didn't do it very well. <laughs> we did a little bit, but not really. But poverty didn't, doesn't affect everybody. Climate is going to affect everyone, all of you. It's gonna affect everything if we don't take action. And it's hard to see it on a day-to-day -day basis. It's not visceral, but we are gonna see it very soon. You know, the floods in Germany, the wildfires, wildfires in California, this is just the very tip not affecting that many people. We're gonna see it more and more. To me, this is your fight. And food is, I hope I've convinced you, is one of the most important agendas within the climate, the larger climate agenda. And food tethers you all together. You absolutely need food to survive. You don't really need gas to survive. You could find alternative sources, but we need food to survive. So to me, this is kind of a fight of your life to get out on the streets, fight for a better governance, fight for more change and don't stop to, because this is going to be the challenge of your lifetime. And, 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 and you guys can do it. 
we ha- there's still a big window to change, but it we it's closing. So I hope that you guys uh, feel that um, in a profound way that I do. <laughs> and I'm and I'm almost half dead, you know. <laughs> well, Mario, you have a question, and then I think we have one on the chat as well. Yes, fantastic as always. Uh, you know, I just want to to ask a question for the record because it's 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 one of the typical ones that we we get asked, and it's really any insights on how to modify consumption patterns. What do we really need to do? or in this area? I think people change their diets um, often not, you know, changing your diets to make the world a better place is usually not the way people change their diets. People change their diets when they are threatened personally. (laughs) That's the threat, right? When people realize that their diet is killing them or they see their mom who's, diabetic and has had to have her leg amputated and they have to care for her. Those are the things that change people in dramatic ways around diets. Now, people are changing their diets all the time. We've seen huge shifts. Look at gluten and the shift away from gluten. Basically, minimizing a macronutrient in your diet. Who would have thought (laughs) that something that was not really understood from the consumer lever completely shifted supply? That's a big behavior change. But to me, that's when you're going to see it, Mario, is when people feel threatened from a personal level. Um, And it's usually related to mortality. Mm -hmm. It's related to mortality usually. And that will get them to change. Yeah. Um, Yeah. I, I saw that in your risk factors, the consumption of red meat was really low. The, yeah. the protective factors were more important. Yeah. What do you have to say in relation to meat consumption and, and perhaps decreasing it or increasing it in places and so on? So it's, a, it's just a follow-up question. Um, you already know the answer to this, Mario. Yeah, anyway. yeah, but I want everybody to hear it. <laughs> um, We definitely need to increase more of the healthy stuff, right? The fruits, the veg, the legumes, nuts, and seeds for various reasons, micronutrients, fiber, whole grains, very important. The meat, the meat story is a nuanced one and that, um, really the, the highly processed salted meat cured meats, um, have a significant risk factor for colorectal cancer, um, Red meat is a mixed story depending on the amount, the type, the quality, and the disease outcome that you're looking at. So the animal source food story is a bit a bit mixed. Um, but it's if you looked at the Eat Lancet when it was showing what the world was eating, it was every region was not eating enough of the healthy stuff. Every region, the protective stuff. And that's the conundrum plus the ultra processed foods. The ultra processed foods are the killers. Um, These just very high salt, added sugar, unhealthy fat type foods, potato chips, you know, candy, all that stuff, Uh, soda. That's the real, the more and more evidence around uh, the impacts on obesity and non-communicable diseases is with the ultra processed foods and your microbiome, all kinds of secondary effects, so. Thank you, Jessica. We have a, a question in the chat from Crystal Powers. Uh, Crystal, would you like to uh, unmute yourself and ask that question? Uh, yeah. All right, there we go. Thank you. Um, I guess I'll just mostly read it, but uh, just wanting to hear a little more of the detail on some of the alternative proteins, kind of comparing their nutrient density to their environmental impacts, um, how that, you know, where there's a lot of processing involved, kind of the follow-up question is, is is currently a lot of that's very cons- even more consolidated in who owns um, some of those sources. And so how, what are some ways to make it more equitable and available? Or are there other alternatives? I mean, I only listed a few there, so maybe there's other alternative protein options as well. 
Yeah, I mean, I think it really depends on which one of those, right? So they're all kind of different, but some of these alt, alt proteins, whether it's the you know, plant-based burgers, um, the new plant-based burgers, um, just eggs, lab-grown meats, all of these kind of new foods, um, I think it, it comes down to what you value. Do you value animal welfare? Really important then. Do you, do you value the environment? Probably less environmental impact than cattle. Do you, environment, do you, do you value your health? Mixed bag on that, right? They're considered these ultra processed foods. They're very highly processed. But I think that's all gonna change. I think these companies have a lot of investment behind them. Um, Tyson has bought up massive stocks in some of these alt proteins. I think these products are gonna get healthier and less processed as time goes on. I think the technology is just gonna get better and better. I think the price point's gonna get lower and lower. And I think the demand will go up significantly. Will they be as disruptive as they want them to be, meaning, when you talk to, I think it's Impossible Burger, the CEO, he'll say he wants to eliminate livestock from the planet. That's his goal. Um, is that going to happen? Probably not. Um, but they 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 want to disrupt the system. Um, that's what their their end game is. Um, so, but I, there's a projected significant demand for these foods. Um, I was just uh, discussing with a colleague of mine in Kenya, and they're seeing Impossible Burgers and Beyond Meats in Nairobi supermarkets, and they're kind of flying off the shelves. So this is not just any more a uh, high-income Europe and U.S. demand thing. It's moving into urban centers of Africa and Asia. There's this big demand. The insect story is a different story. Some communities, some countries, it's part of their culture to consume insects. Um, South Asia, Southeast Asia, Mexico, you name it, Africa. Um, so I think that's more of a, what's the form of the insect in and your willingness to consume it as whole or as a powder. Uh, I think there's a big space for insects as well. Yeah. Okay, Jessica, we've kept you longer than we said we would. So thank you so much. Let's have a hand again for Jessica. Thanks so much. That was terrific. Thank you. Take care, everybody. Stay healthy.